I might run through um, injuries, shoulder injuries too, today. I'll probably shorten it to the lecture next time we're at. So, where we left off was with elbows, so we'll pick up with humerus. Uh, just not a whole lot in humerus, but we'll take a look at the, the x rays that um, I had sent to me. Um, I didn't get any until after last week's lecture, so some of them are, are things that we covered previously. Okay, so uh, once we get to the humerus size, uh, in adults and most adults, we're going to need a crib, you know, um, unless we're shooting again a uh, portable, possibly a, a um, um, virtual grid would work, or if, if we have a pediatric patient, they would might not satisfy the, the requirements for grid use, right? So grid use, we've got two rules for grid use, and that is uh, 10 centimeters, which is about four inches or larger. So about shoulder and knee size, and above 70 kvp, we need to use a grid, right? So um, in most adults, you're gonna get there, but if you have a small adult or a pediatric patient, you don't necessarily need a grid. Uh, anode heel effect, again, is, is testable, but it, the, the effects of the anode heel effect are, are pretty minimal with um, with digital processing. So, you know, just file that away that you use, utilize the anode heel effect, put the thickest end of the anatomy under the uh, cathode end of the x-ray tube. Uh, so if we have a, if you have a patient that, that you suspect have a, a fracture and shoulder injuries hurt, I don't know if you've ever had one, but uh, they tend to, to be pretty sore. Um, so sometimes your patients might think they've got a fracture when they really don't. Um, dislocations tend to, to present with a, a very, almost an obvious presentation. So we'll talk about that whenever we get to the, the pictures here in a bit, or uh, that may be next week. Um, so if you suspect the patient has a, a fracture, you might just want to hesitate a little bit before having the patient rotate for either the, the AP or whatever. Uh, you may have the, the patient uh, maybe an, make an x-ray with, with the patient <coughs> in whatever position that they present themselves in before you rotate the arm. So don't, you know, if, if you can help it, don't, uh, don't move or rotate the arm. Sometimes your patients are going to come to you and they're going to be tough. Right, one of the toughest patients I ever saw was a uh, teenage girl who had a, a bone cyst, which we'll take a look at here in a little while. Um, most people don't realize that they've got a bone cyst until they have a pathological fracture. And what happens with bone cyst is that the, um, the framework inside of the bone completely gets eaten away. Um, and eaten away makes it sound like cancer, but it's not. Bone cyst is non-cancerous, but uh, in a lot of cases, what we, we have is a thinning of the cortex, and then it doesn't take a whole lot to break the bone. And this little girl came in, and she was just moving her arm all over the place. She was like 10 years old, and it was like she had no pain. Um, we took the, the first x-ray on it, and it was, you know, obviously fractious. Stop moving your arm. And she's like, oh, I've got like an extra elbow here. I mean, she, she was a beast. Uh, so some of your patients, you're not going to stop them. And, uh, you know, in, in those cases, it, you know, you, you're going to assume that the patient doesn't have a fracture. So it's, it's going to be a surprise to you that you had the patient externally rotate and lo and behold, there's a fracture there. So if you have the indication the patient has a fracture, don't, don't rotate. So the, the reason I have the question mark there with photo time is because it's really kind of difficult to uh, to get a, a, a good photo time image just by lining the patient up and shooting the humerus. And the, the reason for that is because the size of your detector and the size of the humerus, in a lot of cases, the humerus is not the entire anatomy, but the humerus is going to be smaller than the detector. So if the detector is this big and your humerus is that big, you know, you want the anatomy of interest directly over the detector to get the right exposure, right? Well, complicating it is that when you externally rotate the patient's arm, um, you know, your detector is going straight up and down like this, and you have to, to kind of estimate where the bone is going to be going across the detector, right? So if you have, you know, good 
um, technique for a, a you know a humerus, be it AP or lateral, it's better to set a technique. And if you don't, then try to cover the the detector up as much as possible. Try, try to get as much of the soft tissue over the detector as possible. Estimate where the bone is and go ahead and hit it with like a plus two. Otherwise, your your index number is almost always on humerus going to come out too low, or at least in my experience, that's been my experience. So collimate as much as possible to get rid of some of that scatter radiation, some of that direct exposure to your image receptor. Go ahead and hit it with a plus two, but better still, um, you might consider using a, a set technique. If you have no idea of what to use for a uh, set technique, but you're doing multiple exams, like maybe you're doing a shoulder and a humerus, uh, you can base your humerus on the shoulder. So you make your exposure on the shoulder, easier to photo time, and then back off of that a little bit for the humerus and you should be okay. So upright if, if possible. And uh, the reason I say that is because with any kind of shoulder or humerus pain, if the patient comes to you upright, that's what that assumes is the patient comes to you upright, uh, there's a lot of positional pain. Again, if, if you've ever had any kind of shoulder injury, uh, you know this, you know, broken clavicle, dislocated shoulder, um, anything almost, there's positional pain. So you, you go from upright to laying down and upright again and it hurts, right? So whatever position the patient's in, just go ahead and shoot them that way. So again, in my experience, most of the people I've, unless they were truly in a trauma, they came to me upright or humorous maybe in a sling or something like that. So instead of putting them on the table and setting them back up, um, I find it easier just to do them uh, with patient upright. Also though, uh, since you're shooting an anatomy that's way out on the lateral portion of the patient's body, if you're on the table, you're gonna have to scoot them all the way over to the table's edge in order to get this done. So again, just easier to do upright if at all possible. And certainly if, if the patient presents to you upright. So uh, for AP, what, what we want to do is externally rotate. This is assuming the patient can externally rotate. Um, then your humeral condyle should be parallel to the image receptor. Abduct the arm just a little bit to get rid of some of the soft tissue. Um, what you may have to do, and this gets a little bit dicey, is you may have to externally rotate as much as the patient can and then oblique the patient just a little bit towards the, the, that, um, that side. So if you're shooting the left shoulder, you may have to, left shoulder, left humerus, you may have to oblique the patient just a little bit to get the humerus in true AP. But the problem that you run into is soft tissue. You know, if, if you like, you know, if I oblique me this way, um, you know, there's increased soft tissue. And if you have a patient with large breasts, that's gonna be, a, that's gonna be an issue, right? So. Uh, watch out for that and abduct the, the shoulder. Um, so uh, what you want to see in external rotation is the greater tubercle in profile. So on the test, all the way through the registry, and I think we talked about this in your first year, you know, just follow your thumb. If you externally rotate, then you're going to see the greater tubercle on the outside, right? If you internally rotate, you're going to see the lesser tubercle on the inside. And when we get to shoulder, uh, I've never really understood why we do a neutral rotation. Nobody, including doctors, have, have ever explained to me the benefit of the neutral rotation, but it's still a, a part of a, a lot of hospital protocols. Um, so neutral rotation would just be, you know, the, the thumb would be pointing anteriorly and you don't see the greater or the lesser tubercle. The, the hand is up against, up against the thigh. So um, <clears throat> fractures, the fracture types that we see, you know, it could be almost anywhere. We can, we can have distal fractures, we can have proximal fractures. And depending on the patient's condition, the patient's age, the type of fracture determines the, the type of treatment that they're gonna have. So this is particularly nasty here. Uh, this is your characteristic spiral fracture, bayonet fracture. You got sharp shards, right? Um, you can do damage to the patient by manipulating that. So you don't want to rotate that around. Uh, same thing with this guy over here. Um, this one's in a, a, a sling, it looks like. Uh, just a transverse fracture on that. Probably not a whole lot of damage if you rotate that, but it could, could potentially be a lot of pain, right? So you, again, you, you don't want to do that unless you absolutely have to. Looks like that one over there is a, a kid too. But another one that we're going to take a look at when we get in shoulder 
is uh, a, an impacted fracture where, and it usually happens in patients who have osteoporosis, they fall and the shaft of the humerus goes up into the head of the humerus and it's, it's an impacted fracture. Um, and it, again, depending on the, the patient's condition, their overall condition, they might not do anything except for sling that patient and just you know, let it heal naturally. Um, in my experience, it's most common. But again, if, if the patient's still active and they got good bone structure, uh, they may very well fix it, um, put a rod in it, possibly plates and screws and things like that. So external rotation puts a greater tubercle in profile way out here. Uh, pediatric humerus, you know, evaluation of pediatric humerus is a little bit more difficult to tell whether or not you're on internal or external rotation because the greater tubercle hasn't fully formed, the humeral head has not fully formed. So you're gonna have to look at the distal end to determine whether or not the patient's in external rotation. It looks like they're partially in external rotation, maybe a little bit, uh, maybe not completely rotated out quite as far as what it needs to be. Remember that the radial head is going to have some degree of superimposition on the ulna, which we see there, but it looks like it's a little bit more than what it needs to be. So I think kids probably in, in some degree external rotation just may not have the, the uh, humeral condyles completely parallel. So uh, what we want to see is the distal end should look like an AP of the elbow. The proximal end, we should see that, that humeral condyle, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the greater tubercle in profile on the proximal end. It should be sticking out there just like a flag. Um, it's very obvious. So if we're under rotated, what that's going to do is it's going to take that, that um, tubercle and it's going to hide it behind the humeral head a little bit. Um, and if it's over rotated, it's going to be easier to see on the distal end. What we're going to see is the superimposition of radial head from the ulna. So uh, looking at these, uh, we see a little bit of the, the humeral head here, right? But what do we see on the distal end? <clears throat> Increased superimposition between the radius and the ulna, and that would indicate that we've got more neutral. internal rotation, right? It's more like a, a neutral rotation. And then here we've got the superimposition. This is a little bit deceptive in some cases, you know. Uh, it looks pretty dramatic, and uh, it does look like the humeral condyles not parallel. We do see the desuperimposition, but sometimes if we have a little bit of bend in the elbow with that external rotation, it makes it look a little more dramatic than what it actually is. So on the proximal end, you can still see, though, the greater tubercle in profile. So lateral positioning, you got, you got a lot of different options for lateral positioning as you should have multiple options. So uh, we're going to talk about normal lateral positioning then we're going to talk about trauma. Okay, so normal lateral positioning, uh, again, if the patient can't rotate, then you want to make sure that, you know, if, if you're trying to get the patient into either AP or a lateral, you know, you can use a little bit of body English on it, just watch out for the, the soft tissue, and I'm not gonna make it weird by pointing out the soft tissue. Uh, but the, uh, the lateral, <laughs> you got a couple of options. Um, so what, uh, what we tend to do sometimes is have a patient hold the, the arm across the, the stomach like so, which is gonna put the, the humerus at a little bit of an odd angle. Right, so what you're gonna see is some distortion, distortion, some foreshortening, magnification on the distal end. So if the patient can tolerate it, you're better off abducting the arm, get it off of the stomach, maybe put it on the hip if at all possible. Uh, you could even put it behind the patient's back. But what you're trying to do is put those humeral condyles perpendicular to the image receptor. It should look a little bit like a, a um, lateral elbow, but because of the divergence of the central ray, you're not going to get that good, let's see if I can make it happen, that good round appearance of the superimposed condyles because of the divergence of the central ray, right? Uh, also, you know, that one's not bent to, to 90 degrees, so you're not going to see it anyway, but even if you were bent to 90 degrees, it's not going to look like a perfect elbow. Um, and if the patient can't abduct enough to get, you know, the 
the entire humerus parallel to the image receptor, you can turn the patient around and shoot a PA. A lot easier if the patient really is in pain and they're, they're holding their, their arm. You just shoot a PA, just turn the patient around. And the patient's position, you know, would, if they were on the table, it would be prone, but upright. They're, they're facing the image receptor and your, um, your actual projection, I guess, because of the, the, the position of the arm there would be, that would be medial lateral projection. Uh, if you've looked in the books, uh, in the book at the, the different projections of humerus, um, you know, it, it goes into, is this medial lateral? Is this lateral medial? I'm not gonna ask you that. Even if I put images up, I'm not gonna ask you medial lateral, lateral medial, because it doesn't really matter. You know, you're not trying to uh, determine from a, an, an x-ray which projection the patient was in. Right? You just, is it good? Is it not good? Um, what's wrong with it? It's not good. So, uh, just options. So, uh, what we've got here is we've got partial superimposition. You notice they're, they're oval in appearance. So, you know, not perfectly superimposed, but a pretty decent lateral. It gets a little light on the proximal end, but it's, it's not all that bad. So, um, <clears throat> the soft tissue issues we already talked about, proximal end, distal end. All that. So with soft tissue, this is a very clearly a very large patient. Um, and what we have over here is under rotation. And I think probably the, the patient's arm is across the patient's body because the, the humerus just does not look right. It looks like we've got some sort of distortion there. It's not pointed out um, in the book, but I, I think that's probably what we've got is the arm is across the chest and across the stomach and uh, that does two things in this case one is it under rotates and the other is that it puts the the uh, the entire humerus at an angle to the image receptor so if you suspect the patient has a fracture then you've got a couple options there too um, so on the distal end what we're going to do is slide the image receptor up under the patient's arm until it gets as high as the patient can tolerate Right, so um, a couple of things in that. One is your image receptors now are so much larger than what they were 20 years ago. Now, I don't mean just in the, the overall size, but I also mean in the thickness. So that's gonna cause some, uh, some issues with getting it as high as what we used to be able to get the, the image receptor. It's like taking a big fat textbook and sticking it up under there. It just, you know, it's, it's fatter. Also, though, it's a whole lot more expensive. You know, our, our 14 by 17 uh, image receptors are, are screens and films back in the day, like $600. Those things you're working with are maybe 50,000, okay? So be real careful with anything that you're gonna hand the patient to hang on to, right? Because if that thing hits the ground, you got a problem. So. Be real careful with them. Make sure that you think that the patient can tolerate and, and manage holding an image receptor like that before you give it to them. If you got an older patient that just doesn't have any body strength left, you know, uh, you, you need to come up with something different. So uh, that would get you your distal end. So going back to our fractures that, that we looked at before, if we were taking an x-ray on this patient, then we could probably see that entire fracture there, but we still don't know if the patient has a fracture on the proximal end. So we still have to do something for the proximal end. We've seen the distal end. We're still gonna need to do something for the proximal end, right? So um, our options for the proximal end um, are to either shoot a uh, transthoracic, which is just a hideous view, or a wide view, which I didn't say the wide view is hideous, right? So you can kind of tell which one I prefer to do. Wide view is a much better view, much lower exposure to the patient, um, and uh, it just requires a whole lot less of you. You don't have to worry about uh, long exposures, introducing motion artifact, even though you want motion artifact in everything except for the humerus, right? because you want breathing technique to get rid of everything else, but you know, you got a patient with a uh, shoulder that's, that's really hurting, they might move, which introduces motion artifacts you don't. 
So um, I recommend the, not the transthoracic for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and I do recommend Wideview for the reasons that I just discussed. So what we want to do with the transthoracic, we've got to go ahead and talk about it because it's testable, is elevate the arm, the unaffected arm, put the, the affected arm closest to the image receptor, and you can even slightly oblique the patient. And what I mean by slightly oblique is just that. I wish I had something to hang on to this better with than my hands. And this, you know, I do this every year and it never works. You're gonna try it again. But I'm gonna try it again, exactly. It's man logic. Yeah. It's, guess what it's not gonna do this year? Hmm. Work. Oh, wait, look. Love it. Okay. Ah, I had it, I had it. Maybe scissors? You can put like a rubber band on the end of it. Bro, you got scissors on you? No. Okay, okay. Right. Look quick, look quick, look quick. All right. You see it's round, right? Yes. When I say oblique, just oblique a little bit. You see how that subtle movement separated them anterior to posterior, right? Yes. All right. So um, that's what I'm talking about in, in oblique is you've, you've got the patient here. So you elevate one arm. Um, you still might have some superimposition issues. It's not something that you see in the textbook. But what you might do is have that arm up and oblique the patient maybe five degrees just to separate them anterior to posterior to get the two shoulders off of each other. They're probably not going to be on each other anyway, but just to be sure, uh, oblique them a little, just the tiniest amount just to separate the two. So what you're looking for is the upper third. Um, and what you're going to use is long exposure, uh, at least a second, preferably up to three seconds. Have the patient breathe throughout the exposure. Uh, anybody shot a breathing technique on anything? Okay. So the problem with breathing technique in a lot of cases is that you've shot two or three views before that, right? Um, and you shot them and you've told, tell, told, told, Hold the patient to hold their breath before you make the exposure. So they hear you rotor up and they've learned. And what are they going to do? Hold their breath. Hold their breath, right. So what I recommend that you do is watch the patient. And if they, if you notice that they stop breathing, then you tell them, you know, breathe normally. I don't recommend that you tell them to breathe normally until you notice that they're not breathing. Because if you tell them to breathe normally, it almost always keeps them from breathing normally. Right? So they, they start breathing. Uh, you tell them to breathe normally. It's like, oh, what, what, how do I normally breathe? You know? And their breathing becomes more shallow and it becomes slower. Okay? So watch them. You know, rotor up. Watch them. If they stop breathing, say breathe normally. Um, and you'll get a better, better breathing technique if, if they're breathing, truly breathing normally. Uh, all right? So uh, transfer acid. Wideview. So we're going to talk about Wideview here and also in the shoulder. Um, you can shoot Wideview AP, you can shoot a PA, doesn't really matter. In my experience working with other technologists, most people shoot at AP. And that's fine. That's fine. I always shot my PA because I didn't like my, again, back to screens and films. If you shot at AP, then your scapula was like a foot long. Seriously. It was massive. I didn't like the look of that. I always shot my PA. Um, but with, you know, your larger image receptors and digital processing, it doesn't look as weird as what it used to. So shoot an AP, PA, whichever one works for you. Um, and the, the textbook, the textbook positioning says to put your, put your fingers on the axillary border, which is a fat, puffy one, and the vertebral border of the scapula and rotate the patient until those two are superimposed. Problem is, unless you've got somebody who just is at, you know, 10% body fat or less, you're not going to do that. You're not going to feel those things, right? So what I recommend you do is just put your hand on where the patient's scapula is. And with this guy, you can see that this, uh, this posterior superior uh, edge is a little, you know, it, it sticks out a little bit. And all that's going to be filled in with soft tissue, right? So if you put your hand on that and you put your hand 
and oblique patient to your hand is perpendicular to the image receptor, what that means is, again, I'm going PA because this is how I always shot mine, is that your hand is going to be perpendicular to the image receptor, but your scapula is going to be slightly oblique, just a little bit. So again, subtle, very subtle, five degrees or less, you're going to put your hand on that, uh, put your hand perpendicular, and if you're shooting PA, you're going to go back towards prone about five degrees so that your hand is oblique about five degrees. And you could do the same thing with the patient um, supine or AP. You can do the same thing, just oblique the patient up, right like that, and then oblique the patient more towards, in this case, it would be, you know, supination or, or straight AP. Subtle, five degrees. So it's from here to here, right? Very, very subtle. And that should take your uh, vertebral border and put it right, vertebral border and put it right on your axillary border so that the two are on top of each other. We'll take a look at, at what that should look like here in a minute. All right, so all that. All that. Transthoracic. Uh, could you make a diagnosis of a fracture? Probably so. Right, as long as it was a displaced fracture. Subtle fractures may uh, cause a little bit more of a problem. Um, and we'll take a look at the, the wide views in shoulder. Uh, we may not get a, a look at those today. So upper extremity uh, pathologies, we'll run through these and the, the submissions and um, we'll start, probably start on that slideshow, maybe not. So we've got fractures, we've got bone cysts, um, and bone cysts, again, are going to lead to pathological fractures. Um, we've got growths that are non-cancerous, so that'd be an osteo... That's not candroma, that's osteochondroma. Um, there we go. We have uh, cancers, which are osteosarcomas. Then we've got osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis. Uh, so some of those, obviously, we've talked about before. All right, so bone cysts uh, tend to be idiopathic, meaning, you know, we don't know what caused them. They also tend to be uh, the, the origins. We, we know the mechanism, but not necessarily the origins. Um, they also tend to be asymptomatic until you get to a point fracture. Um, so if you see one of these, you know, especially in somebody that you know, you know, you take the x-ray on somebody and you, you see one of these, it's going to scare you to death because the presentation is going to look kind of like cancer, but there's subtle differences, okay? So what you get in a bone cyst, uh, most of the time they're, uh, they're hemorrhagic, uh, meaning you've got a busted blood vessel that just caused this thing um, and uh, can be traumatic um, and then there's simple. All right, so what you see is an area of increased density, so it gets darker, right? And it may distort the bone, uh, it may not. Like this guy over here, you've got no bone distortion yet. They tend to be uh, more prevalent in kids and young adults, all right? And again, you know, this one's so big that there's a pretty good chance that you've got some deformity there. So that's probably, you know, well, they took a look at this. So, but what you see in a bone cyst is you can still clearly see the cortex, all right? So that's the significant difference between a bone cyst and cancer. But that gets a little bit harder to discern if there's a fracture line running through it. So, um, you know, if, if you happen to, to see this and somebody you know, you know, don't jump to the, the immediate conclusion that, you know, we've got a Ewing sarcoma or something like that. Most of the time, if it's a young patient, it's gonna be a bone cyst, most of the time. So again, uh, most of the time, asymptomatic and, until there's a, the presence of a fracture, but because of the, how thin the cortex gets, it's still there but it's very thin than what we see sometimes is, you know, the weakened bone and the fracture. So osteochondroma is a really interesting thing. It's also benign, so, um, you know, no reason to freak out if you see one of these. 
but it's a bone growth. And the, I, I don't know that uh, this is what I saw before, but I used to have a pretty good file of x-ray films that I kept at the hospital that um, you know had all kinds of stuff. And this woman was in a, a car wreck and she got, um, she got uh, T-bone, right? And she was fine. She didn't even have any broken ribs, but she had some sort of condition that kicked off osteosarcoma, uh, I'm sorry, chondromas, um, with almost no stimulus, okay? So on that side, on the x-ray, it looked like a double exposure because what she had was she had some, some pretty good, pretty good lick to the ribs, but I don't think any of them were broken. But what happened was her body started kicking off osteochondromas off of each one of those ribs that made it look like she had two sets of ribs on that side. It was really, really freaky. Um, so if you ever start collecting images, don't leave them at the hospital because almost all of my cool x-rays disappeared. So uh, osteochondroma is just bone growth uh, and it's benign and you know, again, it may cause a problem like what we're seeing here. Uh, if it's causing a problem with the knee extending, then obviously that's a problem. Still benign. But osteosarcoma, now we've, we've got actual bone cancer. You see where the, the cortex is, it just has a, that eaten away appearance. It just looks like, I don't know, almost like rotten wood, right? So that's bone cancer as opposed to bone cysts. Bone cysts just increase uh, radiographic density, not patient density, just the increased radiographic den density, thinner cortex, as opposed to that. So osteoporosis, uh, we've talked about osteoporosis and, and what it leads to, and that is, again, thin wall bones, and uh, that leads to fractures. So uh, what happens with osteoporosis is, this doesn't really tell the whole story, it, it shows how the, the inside of the bone gets more porous, but um, it doesn't show the cortex, right? Down here, what we see is uh, a loss of cortex, not just the inside of the bone, but the cortex of the bone goes away too. So um, what happens in osteoporosis is, uh, and this is my PSA portion of this particular lecture, but um, what you get with osteoporosis is uh, your, your body, the mechanism behind bone growth remains the same, but your body tends to, uh, so what, and what I mean by that is your bones undergo deterioration all the time, right? And we talked about that a little bit last week, I think. So the bone breaks down all the time, but your body takes it and puts it back together and builds and re-strengthens the bone. When you're a kid, the building of bone happens faster than the, the deterioration of bone. That's why you grow. But when you, you're an adult, then you enter a, a stage of maintenance. And then as you age, you still break down the bone, but your body in osteoporosis doesn't, um, doesn't pack it all back in right, okay? So you're still undergoing the, the bone degeneration, but it doesn't, the bone building uh, doesn't, it happens to everybody, but worse in osteoporosis, uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, rebuild the bone at the proper rate. And that's what you get here, is bone loss that leads to, again, pathological fractures. And where that comes, um, let me get this, I'll magnify this, so you can kind of see what, Hopefully, it, well, hopefully you can kind of see what they're, what they're trying to drive at here is that that, in a lot of cases, will lead to um, compression fractures in the spine, lead to spinal deformity, um, and that usually results in at least some increased kyphosis in the T-spine, if not some, some scoliosis to go with it. Okay, so uh, you lose height, uh, you start to slouch, and the, um, the, the cause of that is, again, multiple compression fractures in the spine. So now the PSA part of, of all this is, you know, you've, you've probably heard, you know, somebody say, well, I've got osteoporosis, so I've got to take my calcium. At that point, it doesn't matter 
okay? It doesn't really matter if, if you take calcium once you're in osteoporosis. You can do it, but you might get kidney stones, correct? So now you got osteoporosis and kidney stones. So the best way to fight osteoporosis is not by taking calcium once you develop osteoporosis, is to go into osteoporosis with as strong of bones as possible, okay? So it's better to take your calcium now, it's better to drink your milk now, uh, because menopause is gonna, well, we've got probably two thirds of the people in this class, right? You're gonna be prone to menopause, right? Better to get your calcium in now, build strong bones now. For later, what's that? He said sorry, kid, we're missing out. <laughs> so that's my PSA. Right, not to scare you or anything, but just to encourage you to, you know, drink milk. I mean, y'all get everything. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, that's all with men. Yeah, but, you know, y'all been through pathology. How many of those pathologies uh, affected boys more than girls? I'd say probably two-thirds of them. So this is this is our one win. Let us have it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, room toward arthritis. Plus, we just try to kill ourselves through our entire youth, right? <laughs> <laughs> youth all the way up through young adulthood. You know, let's hold my beard and watch this. So, uh, room toward arthritis looks a lot like osteoporosis. Uh, the, the significant di difference in the two is deformity in the joints. Um, with room toward arthritis, we also get bone loss, but we also get uh, you know, the articular ends get eaten away, and that's what we're, we, we have. So most of the time, if you've got a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, an older patient with rheumatoid arthritis, you can see the deformities. So in the head of the owner's just gone? What's that? Head of the owner's just gone? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just <laughs> eaten away. It looks like, uh, you know, you've got fusion of the, the carpal bones and possibly the loss of some of the proximal row there. And osteoarthritis, certainly you can have, uh, you know, some deformity at the articular surfaces because that's, that's because you've got bone on bone. It's not because you've lost bone um, due to, to pathology. It's just, you know, you grind two things together long enough and something's got to give. So you, in this case, you've got, you know, in both of these, you've, you've got a loss of the joint space and then the, the grinding away of the bones. But what you get at the articular surface is an increase in bone density because of that constant stimulation. Um, so you, you get that brighter appearance at the articular surface than um, you know what you would have again in room toward arthritis. Quick question. Yeah. Not other people. Is the patella gone in A or is it just unless? Uh, you know, I, I think that the bone is just so dense that you can't see it. It looks like we've got patella here and possibly here. It's just hard to make it out because, you know, all the arthritis in there. It's, so it's also kind of mainly, does it go away just because it's grinding? Yeah. But yeah. it kind of builds up at the same time? Right. Kind of thing. right. At, the point, so you, at the point of grinding. Yeah. And yeah. rheumatoid so the, just kind of just deteriorates. Rheumatoid, well, rheumatoid is, is a, I think it's auto autoimmune, oh, so okay. it's, it's, it's actually a, okay. a process, whereas osteo is just, I got old. Okay. I'm warming these out, and this is the result of it. That's you know? the way I had it in 24. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, then we'll get into the, the images that, that y'all sent, and uh, that's ugly. Uh, so Cassie, was was this your patient? Yeah? Um, it actually was Adriana's. Adriana's? Yeah, so what, what happened? Um, Weatherford? Not exactly sure, but I know she told me that's a cow they had to put underneath it, so that's what was lying there. Okay. So the, the, that's gotta be was this, all, all this? That's a cow. That's a cow? Okay, okay. I think they hit a cross tree. Hit a what? Cross tree. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, probably, you know, two demographics I've, I've personally seen most common, commonly have, uh, you know, wrist fractures, old patients and, and young patients. And, uh, I'd, uh, you know, trampolines and bicycles are, are just, they're, they're hard on kids. Um, 
but what are you going to do? You know, you got to let them have a good time and let them grow up, right? And old patients just have a tendency to trip and fall. What's that? that one's a green stick? No, no. Not this one, but over there? Okay. No, neither one of these green sticks. This is the same patient, I'm, I'm quite sure, but uh, it's, it's broken all the way through on, on both of them. So, you know, you might look at that and say, well, that, that kind of looks like a buckle, but I, I don't think that they would call it a green stick. Uh, just because it's, you know, I mean, you by the strictest sense, you, it, once they open the patient up, take a look at it, maybe, but, um, yeah, it's, they're, they're not going to call it a green stick. Um, all right, so what we have here, Joel? Uh, it was a, I don't know his job, but it was a worker, and he fell on the job site. Oh, yeah. And he came in holding like this. And then he, he was Spanish-speaking, so I stood up first and did that, and <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> he said it didn't want to. Huh? Uh, you know, again, some of your patients they'll they'll do whatever you tell them to do. Uh, you know, a broken shoulder or whatever you tell them to do something, they'll grit the teeth and just get after it. Looks like you just got the lateral and the lower half. Yeah, yeah, and that's the yeah. upper half just stayed the same. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. Well, and that's a great observation. What we see here is what greater to purple. Greater to purple, exactly, which we see on the. Good job. Okay. <laughs> so, so what you got here is a lateral of distal end, an AP of the proximal end. You got a you got a medial rotation of the proximal end and an AP of the distal end. So, so but this brings up something very important. All right. So let's say you're doing a um, transfer esc on a patient. All right. So let's say you've got a patient. and He's one of these guys that you know do whatever you want him to do. And you say, okay, I need need you to do this, and they externally rotate. And you make the exposure and it comes up and it's obviously broken, right? You tell the patient to relax, then what are they gonna do? They're gonna draw it straight across the chest. All right, so now humeral condyles are here for the AP, right? What are they now? They're pretty pretty close to lateral, right? And you, you think, okay, well, I gotta do a transthoracic because you know it's broken. Mm -hmm. So you turn the patient. But what are the, the now? What's the orientation of my AP, humeral condyles? We're back to AP. You're right. So you do an AP and then you do a transthoracic AP, right? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to have the the humeral condyles in the same position with AP and the lateral, right? So AP. Now you're going to rotate the patient and do the lateral, right? Otherwise you're going to have you know <laughs> kind of like what we've got here. You're gonna have AP of one end, lateral of the other. So whatever position, I think this is a test question, so you might wanna lock that in. Whatever position the, the humeral condyles are in for the AP, if you should have surgical lateral, or surgical lateral, if you should have surgical lateral for the, yeah, for, you know, the humerus, you, you just need to pack up and go home. Cause that's a hit, right? So for the humerus, if you do transthoracic, then whatever position they're in for the AP, leave them in for the lateral, for the transfer acid. All right, so uh, I would be interested to see what this was. And Joel said that, you know, that just this was an incidental finding. He didn't know that it was here. What what was he in for? Do you uh, remember? Well, his coworker said, uh, he kept having like shakes and stuff. And his coworker said, you need to go get checked out before you lose the hand. And that would brought him to the hospital. He, because he, he didn't want to quit working. Oh, yeah. But it was arthritis within the official report. Okay. And he was a gravestone maker. So he thinks that metal is from, like, just in the past some time that it's gotten to his hand. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, if, if you, I mean, you look at it. I, I was looking at it in my office, and I thought, well, this almost looks like what we were talking about last week with lead pencil. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's not a young person. It doesn't look like they're really old. But you can see that they've got some some loss of joints, so you know some pretty good arthritis going on here. Um, so I, I thought maybe it might have been a pencil lead, but it might have been part of a chisel or whatever. I don't know what they used to carve these gravestones down. So uh, Juliana, Coles. Um, yeah, he was just a larger ER ER patient. He just fell. Just and fell. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's a Colley's fracture. Uh, remember, we've got two distal uh, radius nulla fractures, Colley's fractures, posterior displacement. 
So, you know, you catch yourself all the way down. Um, and the, the Smith's fracture is the opposite where we've got anterior displacement. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it, which one was it? Let me go back. Maybe it's, maybe I'm just not seeing it as well as what I did in my office, but uh, there was one that I was looking at that, that the positioning was, uh, even with the fracture, it was really spot on. You know, the, um, the pisiform was right over the distal end of the, the scaphoid. Oh, here it is, here it is. So, uh, Leslie, this one's yours. That's my arm, actually. That's you! <laughs> I was about to say okay. you turned turn yours. The reason so good is because I wanted it to be good. Yeah. Because, but I was in so much pain, but I was like, get the, just get it. You know, get it done. Just yeah. my whole body, and so yeah. I ended up getting it pretty spot on. Yeah, you did, because yeah. there's the piss form, and there's the, the distal portion of the scaphoid, so it's almost perfect lateral, which of the two is a more important one to see uh, well positioned. It's a little bit oblique. You couldn't have done better than that? I mean, come on. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your uh, your pain with us. But, you know, I mean, if, if we had a scaphoid fracture, that, you know, that, that might have been beneficial to have that uh, little bit of oblique going on there. And then Sylvia, uh, what happened to this guy? Well, he got hit by a train. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say he's in pretty good so shape. Was that? That's not the reason why he was in there. He got into a car accident. Jesus and Christ. then whenever he had surgery, I guess they forgot a staple or something. But that staple is underneath his skin. Oh. It's okay. Immediately. Uh, but okay. He, but yeah, he got hit by a train. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd say if he got hit by a train, he's, he's looking remarkably well. <laughs> um, did the, did the uh, staple, was it infected? Did it cause an infection? No. No? No, it was just chilling. Okay. Okay. I was, was going to enlarge it and see if it looked yeah, like there was any gas under, you know. So, um, and then the scapula, or the Y view. Yeah, I just, the patient was in a car accident and she really wasn't willing to move. Oh, yeah. And that was the best position we could get without her literally trying to fight us. But oh, yeah. yeah. It awesome. didn't look like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what we're going to talk about in in uh, live views is, um, and when we talk about shoulders and dislocation, is that you can determine the dislocation based on where the humeral head is in relationship to the glenoid fossa. We've got a little bit of oblique here. Uh, enlarge this. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's tough to get a patient in a good position if, if they won't stand up, yes, if they can't stand up. Yeah, it's, it makes it a whole lot harder to get a good wide view with a patient laying down. Uh, so we've got some, some uh, superimposition between the ribs and scapula. So it's not a perfect wide view, but sometimes you gotta take what you can get. But you can tell the uh, type of dislocation a patient has by the humeral head and where it is inside in relationship to the, uh, to the scapula, specifically the glenoid fossa. So we oblique this guy up and the humeral head should be should be right over the glenoid fossa, like what it is right here, right? And most of your shoulder dislocations are gonna be anterior, which means they're gonna pop out anterior and they're also gonna be low, right? So they, they go out front and down. So most of the time, if, if the patient's upright, you can see that they probably have a dislocated shoulder before you make an x-ray, because first off, they're kind of slouching, and they're holding their arm, they're holding their arm high uh, just take some of the weight off of it and it just looks wrong you know it just doesn't look like the the firm shoulder that you're used to seeing so if it pops out anterior and inferior what that means is that the the head of the humerus is going to appear over the ribs um, I think statistically speaking they say 95 percent of your shoulder dislocations could be anterior so that's that's the appearance that you're going to see and, uh, you know, I mean, because 
the patient, the, the scapula is not perfectly lateral. It's given us that appearance. It's inside the ribs. It might be dislocated, it might not be dislocated, but a dislocated, anteriorly dislocated um, shoulder is always going to be over the ribs. If your posterior dislocation, it's got to climb up over that, that uh, glenoid fossa to pop out posteriorly, which means, and I've never seen this, uh, they say 95% are going to be anterior. In my experience, 100% have been anterior. I've never, never seen a posterior dislocation. But it's going to have to climb up over that, that lip of, of the glenoid fossa to pop out an, uh, posteriorly. And then it's, it's going to be out and away from the ribs. So over the ribs, anterior, not over the ribs, posterior. That out. I sent mine to the Canvas message. I had a green stick. For you. There you go. Okay. I sent some on Cam through your Canvas messenger. And I just sent okay. another one as a promo. I forgot that I had. Okay. I'll take a look while I get back from And then okay. I had one little boy that was a stick fracture. Oh, yeah. No. Okay. Um, let me take a look at this. Did I not? And that's almost, yeah, so it's not even. Oh, I forgot to take another three weeks. Feel that? I just know there's no chance I got other three. Yeah, I'll have to take a look. All right, so let's start shoulder and that'll uh, give us a shorter class next time around. Because what we're going to talk about in shoulders is a, a number of different things. We're going to, um, we'll talk about the, the AP and maybe um, you know the the axillary, and then maybe look at some some fractures in the shoulder, and we'll leave the rest for um, for next time around. So uh, grid use again. Um, don't need to walk back through that. Uh, some positioning problems that you might run into is that, uh, you know, you, your patient may, because of shoulder pain or because of their age and, and possible compression fractures, they may present to you kind of kyphotically. Uh, so if you have a patient who's, you know, they're, they're kind of favoring that shoulder and they're bending over, uh, try, to, try to get them to stand upright. If the patient's kyphotic because of compression fractures, you may have to adjust with your central rate a little bit. But we're going to take a look at what some of the the uh, shoulders look like if the patient presents kyphotic as opposed to with the patient upright. So um, we're going to take a look at dislocations and fractures and all that. So basic anatomy, uh, we've got the acromion process, our AC joint, our clavicle, our corcoid process, um, our centering for, for all your APs is going to be one inch below the corcoid process. Glenoid fossa is here, lesser tubercle is anterior, greater tubercle is posterior, or well, is lateral. Um, and then that's the glenohumeral joint space is the, the shoulder joint. So glenoid fossa is the cup, the uh, greater tubercle is your ball, ball inside the joint. So just talked about that. So I'm not gonna uh, spend any time on that. So with AP, external rotation, just like the humerus, we want our uh, humeral condyles parallel to the image receptor, and we should see a greater tubercle on the lateral side, make sure you follow the thumb. Neutral rotation, you don't see anything except for, you know, the humeral head, glenoid fossa. Um, <clears throat> internal ro rotation is gonna give us a lesser tubercle medially, just like on the humerus, and again, follow your thumb. So. Uh, what we want is the body not rotated. Um, what we're going to be looking for, you know, before we were looking just for the humerus, now we're looking for the overall shoulder and our articulations. Um, so we don't want the body rotated if at all possible. We want to see the clavicle too, as close to the sternoclavicular joint as possible. Uh, if you're using a 10 by 12 image receptor, or not uh, image receptor, but collimated field, you might not completely include the sternoclavicular joint, but you should include the entire lateral side of the, the uh, uh, humerus, right? So 
also in that you might not show the entire inferior angle of the scapula. Uh, most of the time that we're doing shoulder views, we're looking for one of two things, either a fracture or dislocation, possibly AC joint um, separation, but that's usually not with a 10 by 12 uh, image receptor or call midfield. So we'll talk about that. So we're gonna have superimposition of the ribs on the scapula. Um, can't help that. All right, so <clears throat> we're gonna have a fair amount of uh, scapular body obliquity, uh, but it shouldn't be overly foreshortened as what it would be in a kyphotic patient or a rotated patient. Um, and the superior scapular angle should be almost completely beneath the clavicle. So back up to this, what we're talking about is a superior uh, clavicle angle, and we'll take a look at what that should look like on an x-ray here in a minute. So the glenohumeral joint space is going to be closed. So this guy, if he was facing straight towards you, you notice your gleno or your glenoid fossa is at a kind of an oblique angle of about 45 degrees, right? And the, the humeral head is, you know, it's lateral to, but pretty much right on top of it. You're not going to see that joint space. We have specialty views to see that joint space. That's an oblique. It's what we call Gracie method. We'll talk about that the week after spring break. So that joint space is going to be closed. <clears throat> All right, so when we're talking about rotation of the patient's body, what we're going to be looking at is just like what we looked at for chest x-rays, rotated chest x-ray. Um, the clavicle should look like it touches the lateral portion of the spine. It's overlapping the spine here. So what we've got is rotation away from the image receptor. So this guy's obliqued. He's obliqued up this way takes the clavicle and, and drapes it across the, the spine. So we've got rotation away from, as opposed to, to rotation towards, what we're gonna have is separation between the spine and the clavicle. So increased separation indicates that you rotate it towards. And that's probably gonna be your more common rotation. Uh, you have a patient stand up against the image receptor and they have a tendency to kind of rotate in that direction. Especially if you reach for it, again, shoulder pain, can be pretty intense. You know, you, you start trying to touch the patient and they tend to, to pull away from you a little bit. So, this is the superior scapular angle, right? So, uh, what happens if you've got a patient who's kyphotic? What happens, I'll try to demonstrate this by tripping this guy. So, the patient's leaning towards you, and that's not really going to demonstrate, well, that's because I'll let him tilt. All right, so you see the superior scapular angle uh, here, right? As I lean him forward, notice what happens. Right, it comes out of the top. So what you're going to see if the patient is kyphotic, either because they're slouching, right, or because they are truly kyphotic, is you're going to see that poking out of the top. It should not be. All right, <clears throat> so kyphotic. We got it again, as opposed to uh, you know what we should be seeing. So we got glenohumeral joint space closed. Might actually have a little bit of a, a, a separation at the AC joint, um, and then we've got the superior um, scapular angle right there, about where it should be, as opposed to somebody who's kyphotic is poking up above it. Okay, as opposed to lordotic, zero percent of the time have I ever had this problem. Uh, patient's lordotic. Uh, I, I possibly could see this if the patient was laying down and shot a shoulder. Um, aside from that, I, I can't see how upright you could get a patient lordotic um, in a uh, AP of the shoulder. Again, positional pain, patient leaning back like that is going to be pretty awful. So, uh, in our positioning, our, our um, rotation, what we've got here is we've got kind of a, an appearance of external rotation. Um, and this may be a mistake in the textbook. I picked up a couple of them. It looks a lot like the, the greater tubercle, but it's pointing towards that, which would indicate possibly lesser tubercle. So we're going to skip over that and act like that's not there. <laughs> so neutral rotation. Um, you notice the, the uh, humeral condyles on the distal end, uh, they're kind of oblique. 
right? They're at about a 45 degree oblique, so that would be your neutral rotation with the patient's hand up against the patient's thigh. All right, so what we're gonna see on that is notice you don't really see much of anything. The greater tubercle is starting to disappear even though you see a little bit of it um, and you just don't see a whole lot. As opposed to external rotation, you got your humeral condyles parallel to the image receptor and you can see that uh, greater tubercle in profile. That looks like the identical picture just labeled differently. Or is it? Maybe I stuck it in the wrong place. I think I stuck it in the wrong place. All right, so um, greater tubercle, uh, lesser tubercle should be, you know, pretty much anterior, straight anterior. I still don't think it's labeled well. As opposed to internal rotation, you can see the humeral condyle is pretty perpendicular to the image receptor, and you see the lesser tubercle medially. All right, so of the three, in my experience, the, the most common would be the internal rotation and external rotation. Follow your thumb greater tubercle on the outside, external rotation, AP, internal rotation, lateral, your lesser tubercle on the inside, okay? So the uh, inferior superior axial, the axillary is what most people call it, that is providing the patient can assume the position you wanna abduct the arm to 90 degrees. So your central ray angulation is gonna be anywhere from 30 to 45 degrees medially, depending on how far the patient can abduct their arm. Uh, 45 degrees, in my experience, I don't, you know, don't really wanna uh, be in disagreement with the textbook, but 45 degrees, in a lot of cases, is gonna project the, the head of the humerus off of the image receptor. It's gonna make it very difficult to, to visualize. The problem that you have with this is with the angulation um, and uh, the, the size of the image receptors or the, the size of the receptor portion of the image receptors, it's easy to project the anatomy of interest off of the image receptor. So if you have a patient though who can't get their arm out to 90 degrees, you need less abduction. Now, the tips and hints to hopefully make sure that you get the anatomy of interest on the image receptor is these two, all right? So uh, with the axillary, you know, you gotta assume that, you know, I'm laying down and the x-ray beam's coming from beneath me. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the, the, uh, the image receptor and put it right up against the patient's neck, right? And you can have a patient, if the patient can tolerate it, you can have the patient hold the image receptor for you. 90 degrees, right? Have the patient look away from the side of interest. That protects the eyes to a degree, but also have the patient tilt their head over that way. All right, so if my head, and that's the important part, if I have my head just straight up and down like this, the image receptor is right up against my neck, right? But if I turn my head and look over that way, I buy myself about two inches. Okay, now, angulation of central ray, um, you know, if you over angle, the problem becomes that if your image receptor, you know, the framework of, of your image receptor takes up that much of the image receptor and you've got too much of an angulation, you're taking the humeral head and you're putting it right on the edge of the image receptor, right? So no more than 45 degrees if you find yourself clipping the humeral head on every axillary you shoot, just back your, your angulation down, right? It's better to get the anatomy of interest if it's slightly distorted than not get the anatomy of interest at all. Right? So what we're gonna look for for proper angulation is, uh, again, just make sure that you get the anatomy on there and then worry about everything else. If uh, If, what that should do, let me get to a, a picture, a drawing. Okay, so what that should do is it should put the superior and inferior portion of the glenoid fossa superimposed, okay? So that your joint space should be open. The glenohumeral uh, joint space should be pretty well open. Uh, you might have a little bit of superimposition, but it should be pretty minimal, okay? 
and I do want to point out this is not an axillary. This oh, is just for demonstration. But it's not. It's not. There's nothing like it. No, no, this is not an axillary. This is an AP with the patient in abduction, is all that is. All right. Now, I've seen, not students, but technologists try to pass this off as an axillary. It's like, yeah, you can't make them do this again. Uh, that's not an axillary. And um, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to play double advocate. And I think maybe that's, they, they try to do that so that they didn't have to lay the patient down because it's going to get painful to have a patient lay down on the, the table to do an axillary if they come in upright. Um, I've even tried to shoot these upright, right? So have the patient take the, the x-ray tube and flip it all the way around. Two things I've tried to do this with, neither one worked. Uh, but take the x-ray tube and turn it all the way upside down so it's shooting towards the ceiling and have the patient hold the image receptor over their, their shoulder and lean out over the, the x-ray tube. Didn't work. Absolutely did not work. Didn't come close to working. All right? Uh, but I tried, you know. Um, the other one I tried this with, I may have told you this in, the, in your freshman year when we went through skulls, is with zygomatic arches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Total weed over. Yeah, yeah. Also, did not work. Even worse than this, right? But, you know, you give it a shot. So, that is not what that is. And if you try to pass that off as an axillary, everybody is going to know what you did. You know, that is not an axillary. So, don't do that. So, back to this. So, over-angulation, in both cases, over-angulation, under-angulation is going to close the joint space. But where is the uh, base of the coracoid going to be? in relationship to the glenoid fossa, okay? So I'm gonna go back to that picture, and ideally what you should see is the coracoid, which is this thing right here, and the base of the coracoid is way over here. But if you angle properly, it should look like the coracoid base is coming directly off of the edge of the glenoid fossa. Uh, like this, okay, so you got glenoid fossa here, open glenohumeral joint space, and you see how the the, glen, the the coracoid process looks like it's coming straight up out of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what you want it to look like, ideally. If it's not, if you got some sort of gap there, or if the, the coracoid mm -hmm. is coming, looks like it's, it's coming more out of the glenoid fossa itself, then you've got over or under angulation. Okay, so uh, should look like that. So um, that's not what I wanted to see. Angulation. All right, so too much angulation. You see the, the way the, the uh, glenohumeral joint space is closed up? You've got a lot of superimposition there. Okay, that means you either have too much angulation or too little. So that's step one. Step two is to look at where the, the glenoid fossa is in comparison to the coracoid base. So it kind of looks like it's coming out of it, right? As opposed to here, it's way behind it, okay? Not enough angulation, too much angulation. And I think the book has both of those listed with under angulation, okay? But that's too much angulation. It's over angled, un, under angled. Is what those look like. And you can kind of see that again on this. If our angulation came up this way, then that would project the coracoid process out of the way. This way, it would project the, um, the glenoid fossa under the coracoid process, right? So, I want to look at the, the uh, injury because that's, that's always fun. And then we'll call it, call it done. Okay, so we've got fractures, a uh, number of different types of fractures. We've got surgical neck fractures, we've got impacted fractures, we've got avulsion fractures of the greater tubercle. It's kind of rare, but you do see them once in a while. We've got dislocations, we'll take a look at that. I uh, did not see any posterior dislocation. Um, I'll keep looking though. And then we've got AC joint separations. Those are not the same thing. Dislocation, AC joint separation, totally different things. And then we'll look at clavicles and scapular broken, clavicle and scapula. So 
Impacted fracture is where the, uh, the head of the humerus may still be, you know, pretty sound, but what we get is almost like a telescoping of the, the, the neck, the surgical neck of the humerus up into the head. So it looks like we've got maybe an impaction plus, uh, you know, a little bit of rotation. So it, it may be a little more complicated than just straight uh, impacted fracture. So again, depending on the patient's condition uh, and their overall health, they might just hang that. You know, if, if they don't think the patient is gonna tolerate surgery, they may just put them in a sling and uh, let it heal on its own if it will. And if it won't, then, then they may have to come back and risk surgery. So surgical neck fractures, I'm not real sure why all these are over to one side. Uh, these were out of the book and this is just kind of nasty. Um, you know, we've, we've got them snapped off and rotated, and, and I'm not sure, I, I know these two were together because I'm not sure that these aren't the same patient. So this gives you more of a three-dimensional uh, look at, at what we've got going on here. It's not just snapped off, but it's snapped off and rolled around. Uh, that's a, a person had history on that. What's that? So that person had to have been asleep. <laughs> if not, you hope they were. Here with a yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So we have uh, anterior dislocation. Again, 95% of your dislocation is going to be anterior. And you can see that, that it, you know, it's either out anterior or posterior, but it is also inferior as well. Um, again, most of the time you can see these patients, um, you can see the deformity as they come in to, uh, to see you. <coughs> I thought I had a wide view. I thought I had a wide view with a dislocation. I guess not. All right. All right so uh, greater tubercle avulsion fractures. Again, pretty rare, but they do happen, um, and that's got to be painful as well. Just tearing a piece of bone away from, you know, the bone. Uh, the rest of the bones could be pretty, pretty painful. Um, I had a avulsion fracture in an ankle. I've got bad ankles. I stepped in a hole and a uh, very small avulsion fracture, twist my ankle. You know, if, if, you, if you ever see me fall down, it's probably <laughs> intentional uh, because I started to roll an ankle. I might have stepped on, I mean, I, I stepped on a pencil, a pencil. And if my ankle starts to roll, it's a race to get to the floor before I do damage to the ankle. I'd rather <laughs> fall down <laughs> because my ankles are so bad that if, if it starts to roll, I can't stop it. Um, and I'll do more damage to it trying to stop it than to go to the floor. So, you know, if you ever see me go to the floor, just, just ignore it, you know. It's embarrassing. You know, you got to hop up and do that head check, you know. So just act like it didn't happen, okay? All right? So, but that little tiny avulsion fracture, about the size of a, 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 a pencil lead, uh, hurt for weeks. Okay, so I can't imagine what that felt like. Um, so arthritis, just a, again, the joint space just disappears and then you've got bone on bone. AC joint separations are, okay, so most of the time when you hear of football injuries, you know, you left the game because of uh, shoulder separation. This is what they're talking about, is AC joint separations. And they can be subtle and they can be severe. And we had a, a student one year I don't think he still works around here. Uh, Travis Bell was his name. And he had an unrepaired type three Jeez. shoulder separation. Just walking around? He's just walking around, you know. <laughs> he, he'd pick up a portable grid. And I, I, did, I didn't work with him in, in the hospital. He, I think he did his clinicals at, at Mother Francis. They say he'd pick up a portable grid and you could see it. It just go dink. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just wow. that, yeah. But he'd grown to live with it, so he, he didn't really feel it, you know. Um, but you could see it through his TJC uniform, his <laughs> bones stick out. So, um, but they can be subtle, and type one is, is very subtle, and this is really why we do uh, bilateral upright with and without weights, is because if we just did a unilateral, you know, we, we took a look at an x-ray earlier that, you know, didn't have an AC joint separation about that wide, 
right? So that, that'd be a level one. So we shoot bilateral so that we can get a comparison. Is this his normal anatomy or do we actually have a separation? We've, we've got a separation there comparing the two. So in your um, with and without weights, you know, you got to take this all the way through the registry. You know, it's better to have the weights attached to the patient's wrist or elbow because if you put the weights in the patient's hand, they have a tendency to pull against them, right? So just remember that. I don't remember if it's on the test or not, to be honest with you. But my main critique with this is, did you really need all that? You've got thyroid all the way down to... Almost diaphragm. Yeah, almost the diaphragm to see that, right? Call me. Use your comment. I mean, yeah, they weren't repeating it. No, no, they weren't repeating it because of lack of collimation, but somebody needed to be smart. That's a 458 patient. 458. Somebody get on the pod. All right, so AC joint separation on Y view. Uh, you know, you can see it on Y view as well. I think that uh, some of our clinics are shooting outlet views. Is that still a thing? Outlet view. It's a Y view with a caudal angulation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. 10 degrees, something like that. Yeah, that's a good point. You know what it says? Let's we'll talk about it. Whatever looks good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always show us Excelsior, the glenoid, and they got their own. The Gracie. Yeah. So we'll talk, talk about the Gracie the uh, week after spring break. But, uh, it's a good Y view. Gracie. No, not the Gracie. Gracie method. So clavicle. Uh, you know, common fractures, like you can have a clavicle fracture anywhere on the clavicle, but in my experience, bench shaft is, you know, pretty common. Uh, and, you know, this is, you know, pretty, pretty severe. And in a lot of cases, you can see the clavicle sticking up. Um, my son had a, a clavicle fracture and it, it was, it, you know, he comes walking up and he, Dad, what do you think? <laughs> Do you really need me to tell you? You know, it's broken. No, um, but it was sticking up a little bit more than that. Um, he's, he's my son. I'm surprised he didn't kill himself at some point. You know, uh, obviously not intentionally, but. Yeah, was, he's, okay, so damn it, at Lake Tyler. Mm -hmm. This guy's like 30 years old now, right? So he's not as flexible as what he used to be. And he's out there with a bed sheet and a long board on a windy day, <laughs> going like 30 miles an hour down the dam at Lake Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> you psycho. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's my life. Uh, so uh, this is a, a relatively new situation where, and, you know, the funny thing is my younger son, he, he was an accident prone one. You got him? He was accident prone, one. so he got most of the injuries until he got older. Now my older son, he's still trying to kill himself, and he's getting injuries, um, including the, the clavicle. So this is a relatively new thing. I spent probably more of my career, uh, both full time and PRN, in surgery than anywhere else, and never had I seen an OR O R I F of the clavicle. But they pin everything now, right? So uh, I, I, I think the doctor wanted to, to put a plate on Taylor's clavicle, and he's like, no, I'm not doing that. Um, and this has got to be painful. All right, so we've got a broken scapula all the way back here. Uh, again, shoulder pain is, is bad. Um, my first experience with shoulder pain is, I, what's the, is it the trapezius that, that goes up under the shoulder blade? Yes. Yeah. For that, uh, still a portion of it, not all the way through, obviously, but I uh, had a little tear in it, still have issues with it. And that was when I was 18. I ain't even close to 18 anymore. Uh, but I still, you know, if, if I do something just right, it's still, you know, it'll, if you ever see me turning my body more than my head, it's flared up. So I can't imagine, you know, that, that was musculature. I can't imagine what, you know, a, a fracture of scapula itself would do um, pretty all intense. Those, all those small muscles in there too. Mm -hmm. or, uh, yep. So they complete that too. I don't think it's the same patient, but yeah, you know, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. So plates and screws all over the place. Uh, my younger son, 
he did break his toe, and you know, years ago they wouldn't do anything for toe. Yeah, he dropped the manhole cover on it. He's a surveyor. He didn't drop it. Somebody else dropped the manhole cover. They were having. They were in San Antonio trying to. Um, they were having to survey the sewer system, right? So they pull up manhole covers, stick a stick all the way down into the into the sewer system, and and shoot. You know, they're whatever they do. They survey in the sewer system. Didn't know that was a thing, uh, but somebody else. You know, dropped the manhole cover and came right down on us. So, mm. so yeah, they pinned it. So uh, it went through the steel toe boot, OSHA. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he might not have had his steel toes on. Yeah, you know, lesson learned, right? <laughs>